some of you may have noticed me uh, carrying around this little plush toy from time to time at this conference. Um, this is not mine. This belongs to my four-year-old daughter, Harriet, who sent this to, uh, along with me as her representative, and I take pictures and send them back. Um, it's a bit of a token of one of the things that I want to talk about in this challenge of surviving life as a researcher. Um, this talk is um, an opportunity I'm very happy to have to talk about some of the things that I've learned since I graduated that I really wish that somebody had taught me during grad school so that I didn't have to learn them in quite as difficult a manner as some of them I did, including many of the ones that I still struggle with, like the balance between my life as a professional and the rest of my life. So, um, <laughs> a moment on to, you know, who am I, what do I do as a researcher, uh, before we go spiraling out to wider and more philosophical topics. Uh, many of you uh, saw two days ago, some of the, the work that I do in the area of aggregate programming, um, which then leads off to applications and you know, various sorts of resilient networking, but also you know, because we learned some of the things there from study of biology, we eventually figured out we could bring it back to biology to we'll start talking about spatial patterning, which could then be applied to biological systems. And when I started going down that route, we found all these problems in actually making the biology work, which sort of pulled me down this, you know, black hole into, you know, working on metrology for, you know, biological measurements. So, you know, calibrated flow cytometry and then applying that to, uh, you know, making better biological computing devices and doing organism engineering and all these things. And there's a lot of things that I don't do anymore. So actually none of this has anything to do with what my PhD thesis was. Uh, my PhD thesis was a sort of core AI thing, which didn't end up panning out very well beyond that. And so the things that were distracting me from my thesis have ended up turning into my career. Um, but this is sort of, you know, my world that I live in as a researcher at the moment. But backing out again, you know, why are we here today? If I were a sensible person, I would be at home right now with my daughter, enjoying the finer things in life, like ice cream licked straight from the paper. But I'm not. Scientists, researchers, tend to be driven people. Um, different things drive us, um, and that's often very personal. I think of you know, the, the research career is very much like other creative and entrepreneurial careers. Um, if you talk to people who go off and start businesses, if you talk to artists, if you talk to researchers, you'll find a lot of the struggles that they have are the same, and they all come from whatever it is that's driving us, that's so different from person to person, it does make us make these sort of less sensible choices because for some reason we find it more rewarding to go off uh, you know, to the ends of the earth to talk about very obscure things that few people understand than to stay at home with our families. So I'm just going to take that for granted. I'm not going to say why should we do science. I want to talk about given that we're making this irrational choice to commit ourselves into a very challenging life, what are the things that will help us to know in order to help us survive and thrive in a research profession? One of the things that um, was most profound for me to realize over time is that the research ecosystem is a lot more complex than it appeared to me as a graduate student. In university, as a graduate student, it's very easy to end up with a view of the world which says sort of, you've got the ivory tower of university over here where science happens. And if you leave there, 
then it's a one-way road into the hell of industry, which is a place that you definitely don't want to work. I have discovered, however, <clears throat> that reality is a lot more complicated than I had thought. That, you know, I think university, I don't have a number on this, but my impression um, is that universities <coughs> actually form a minority of the research ecosystem. They're the most visible and sort of the most pure part, but you can end up in a research company like I am at BBN Technologies. There's um, all sorts of corporate labs like the folks from KUKA that we heard talking this morning. Uh, there's a startup world. There's um, you know, working for government organizations. Even within the funding agencies, they have research organizations that are working there as well. There's a lot of different niches within all these worlds. It's very, very complicated. And people move among all of these different areas back and forth. Um, you know, I know somebody who you know, started as uh, you know, a, you know, on the track to be a professor, but then didn't actually become a professor. They became a research staffer at a university. And then they went to DARPA to go and fund people to do things, and they came back to the university. And then they went to go to the government again for a while, and I think may have had a couple of other passages through the exteriors here, too. So one of the things that I want to make sure, as you're uh, you know, wrapping up and thinking about what next, is that you can be a researcher and not necessarily follow the straight and narrow path of grad student, postdoc, you know, into whatever the professor track looks like in your country. Um, there are a lot of places, and you can come back from places too. It's not, you don't step off and vanish. And of course, there are worlds where you don't want to work as well, but they're not as prominent as you may fear. One of the other things that I think is very important for us to understand is that the reality of the scientific world that we live in is a very different world than the one in which the mythologies of our profession were formed. A lot of the sort of ideals of science were formed in this era of the gentleman scientists of, you know, Da Vinci, Galileo, Newton, who could all devote all of their time to science because they were all rich men uh, who had, you know, women and, you know, their servants and all that supporting them to let them live this sort of idealized life in their ivory tower, which doesn't exist anymore. You may have noticed my sort of complex and slightly contradictory um, affiliations on the first slide. I work at BBN Technologies, which is in Boston. And I have an affiliation with MIT, which is basically like, you know, uh, I can get in through the doors there and they don't kick me out because I have some collaborations going on there. And I have an affiliation at the University of Iowa because I'm married to a researcher and she became a professor in Iowa. And so I work typically um, nearly 2,000 kilometers from my desk. Um, and, um, you know, I don't have the privilege of, you know, living a noble life with other people all surrounding me. You know, it's me and my wife and our daughter. The nearest family that we have is also, you know, 2,000 kilometers away. And I need to support my wife just as much as she supports me. So we can't live this sort of purified life anymore because our world is more complex and more equal. We also can't be the Renaissance man who knows everything about everything because our world has a lot more people in it doing a lot more things and a lot more connected to each other. You know, Galileo could know all the science happening in Europe because there wasn't much science happening in Europe. Our world happens much faster it's much more complex and it's much more interconnected. So if we can't follow that ideal of knowing everything, 
being a polymath who can work on any field, etc. What we can understand is that in this more complex world, there are a lot of different niches that you can be as a researcher. Uh, these are some of the folks that I got to know during my time as a graduate student at MIT who all have very different looking careers from one another. So uh, you, know, you have some sort of traditional folks like Nancy Lynch, who is essentially a mathematician of uh, you know, distributed algorithms. She does some wonderful distributed theory work. Um, but then you have uh, you know, folks like uh, Radhika Nagpal, who some of you may know um, as the creator of the Kilobot, these little swarm robots that they've got a thousand of them. Um, and you know, she's somebody who's basically a hacker. She goes in and she gets her hands dirty and she makes something work. And you might not have a clear theory of it, but in practice, you know, she's got a robot that builds things by throwing toothpicks covered with glue into interesting shapes in a pile. And that's just cool. And she's built a great career around figuring out how those hacker things are interesting to a larger world. Um, Martin Renard has basically uh, built his career on being willing uh, to say outrageous things that turn out to make more sense than you think. He's the creator of failure oblivious computing, uh, which is where rather than doing error handling in your programs, you just say, eh, and go on. Turns out this makes most software much more reliable. Uh, it's scary. It undermines everything we believe in. Uh, Joel Moses is, you know, not necessarily the most productive uh, you know, person in the world in terms of the number of papers he outputs. But he's the person who I would go to if I wanted to know, what should I be reading about on this subject? <coughs> Hal Abelson, you know, also hasn't really produced a huge amount of papers, but he's affected all of your lives through the work that he's done, uh, you know, with Lawrence Lessig in uh, building open culture, uh, helping get Creative Commons running. He's off, you know, partnering with Google, doing App Inventor now. Dave Clark is responsible for a lot of the internet. He's not even a professor. In fact, three of these role models of mine including Howie Shrove, who's a longtime uh, Sasso person, and who incredibly shines in the, his ability to organize people to get stuff done. Um, three of these folks have never been professors, and yet they were at MIT for a long time. In fact, these two still are in roles where people don't even quite realize that they're not professors most of the time. So there's a lot of different ways to be a researcher. I think that's important to know too, that uh, you can look, look at all the different role models that you can meet, both within your own institution and at conferences and other places, um, and think about what are your strengths? You don't need to try to turn yourself into a mathematician if you're not somebody who's a mathematician. You need to be good enough at math that you don't embarrass yourself. But if your strengths lie more in one of these other directions, there are niches to do that type of research and make your value in the places that make most sense, given your strengths and your weaknesses. <coughs> Another resource that I've stumbled across and found to be fascinating reading is a talk given by Hamming, who a computer scientist who was at Bell Labs uh, through a lot of the transformative eras in the creation of computing. Uh, you may know him from Hamming Distance, uh, which bears his name. Um, there's a nice transcript of this talk you can find online in which he looks back over his career and muses over all of these incredibly smart folks that he's known. Why is it that some of them have gone on to do great work that's really impacted the world, and others of them 
have done very solid work that made a fine career for them, but never really mattered very much. And there are some interesting heuristics that he picks out there. The ones which resonate most with me are, one is about, you know, thinking great thoughts. He says at a certain point in his career, he decided every Friday afternoon, he was not allowed to do anything but try and think about big problems. Just to keep himself grounded in why am I doing the things I'm doing? What is the bigger picture? You know, how do you get to a place where you can talk about your five-year or ten-year vision like the talk we heard this morning? That's very connected to you need to work hard. We all know that. You've got to work hard. But your choice of what to work hard on matters a lot. Work hard on the problems that are important, not necessarily the problems that are accessible or the problems that are easy or the problems that are the clear next step for what you've been doing. And that may pull you out of your comfort zone a bit. Often, surprisingly, the important problem may not be that far from the not-so-important problem. And one of his advice there is look for generalization. When you're doing a study on a system, it's often not that different to be designing a study of <coughs> does the X algorithm work versus what does the success or failure of the X algorithm tell us about this principle that we use to make it work. And those paths of generalization are paths to get your work to be more relevant to other people and make that problem more important. Work with your door open. Now, there's a metaphorical aspect to this uh, you know, as well these days, but a thing that he noticed was that the folks he knew who worked with their door closed were more productive on less important things. They tended to be more productive because they didn't have people dropping in and distracting them or, you know, walking by having a conversation that then they, you know, came out of their office to go talk to. But the people who had more interactions with more types of people tended to be better at <laughs> figuring out which things were worth spending their time on. Another is about an anti-pattern, um, which is... You can make your life very hard for yourself if we embrace, you know, most of us researchers are somewhat anti-conformist in, in our attitudes uh, in one way or another. And if you choose to make a battle of that on every front, then you can spend an awful lot of time having fights about things that don't matter very much. But, you know, I'm, I'm wearing one of my standard blue conference shirts. Not because I have any particular love for my standard blue conference shirts. Uh, in fact, you know, by default, I would probably be wearing um, a loud tropical shirt uh, because it's a nice summer day outside. But my audience is likely to be less distracted if I at least give the appearance of conforming so that I don't pick a fight where I don't need to. So pick your battles. And it's okay to appear to conform. Especially if you're not really conforming. You're just doing the minimum necessary to not pick a fight that you don't need. Last, one of the most important is, what you do doesn't matter if you can't explain clearly to other people what it is, what its significance is, what they should learn from it. All of these things, learning to communicate is one of the most important parts of being a researcher. In fact, I think being able to communicate well is in many ways at least as important, if not more, than the technical skills that we spend so much time investing in. If you follow these sort of suggestions and, you know, looking around, what, what's the thing that I should be working on? What's important? You may find yourself going in directions that you don't anticipate and that might not fit very well. It can be a somewhat uncomfortable place to be, 
but also an exciting one. So for example, what I consider at this particular moment in time, the most important project that I've been involved in recently, this is over in this space of synthetic biology, where you know, coming in with my you know, high ideals on uh, you know, uh, design and self-organization and patterning and all that, and yet I've been brought down to this space of metrology and a, a fundamental question of like, when we measure fluorescence, is that reproducible? Are there units? Should there be? Some very basic questions that are totally not what I'm interested in doing. But I realized to do the things that I want to do, I need to deal with this. And so um, over the past couple of years, I partnered up with this uh, genetic engineering jamboree called iGEM, and we got a whole bunch of teams of uh, mostly undergraduates <coughs> all over the world. We had uh, you know, 130 different teams participating over those two years. This massive community effort that gave us a whole bunch of critical results on a really pressing problem of how do we establish this just basic ground floor that we all have to have in order to do science. I think this is the most important piece of work that I've been involved in recently, and yet nobody funded it. We put this together on a shoestring filled with volunteer effort because you know, the opportunity was there, no funder was interested, but we needed to do this. The publication out of it was rejected by the high impact journals we sent it to, uh, but we published it in PLOS One, which is fine, respectable enough. And we think this is making a big impact. We're following it up with another one this year that looks like we may actually have a solution to the problems that we were able to diagnose correctly last year. This took me out, you know, off to the side. These things may happen to you. And in fact, your focus is likely to shift over time, perhaps, perhaps incrementally, perhaps radically. Uh, my department head, Joe Loyal, has a saying that I really like to, to quote because I find it very true. Says, no matter what we're doing as researchers, we will not be doing the same work in 10 years. Either we will have succeeded, in which case we need to move on and be doing something different that builds on top of that, or we will have failed and we need to do something else. I find that very true. And in fact, when I look back at the things I've been doing over time, I find that I would have had very little ability to predict what I would be doing on a 10-year time horizon. This doesn't mean you shouldn't have your 10-year vision, but this is research. And we come across unexpected things, both technically and also in just our interaction with our lives and the rest of the world and the ideas out there. And we may end up in a different place than we thought. So, you know, in 1995, you know, as I was on my way towards university, um, I was pretty sure I was going to end up as a video game programmer because that's what me and my buddies in high school did with our spare time. We had our little nerd competition, who could be the best programmer. <laughs> By the time that I'd finished uh, college and was getting started on my PhD, um, I'd gotten serious. I was into this, you know, deep problems at human level AI, you know, big vision of what was going to happen. And by the time that I was finished in 2007, I knew that that project had not come out the way I wanted it to. Uh, it was fine. You know, I made some interesting points. I think that there was some valuable things that happened. I think that some of the things I, I uh, figured out were right, but, I, but there wasn't a path forward from there. In order to do the thing that I thought needed to do, happen next, I needed to either go become a neuroscientist, which I really didn't want to do, or get you know, really big simulation resources, which I also was not inclined towards. And so I completely ended up dropping over time. I, I, I tried to do some more with it, but, but it just wasn't prospering. And the things I'd been distracting myself from my PhD with, I have in this 
spatial computing thing started growing and blossoming. And so, you know, a few years later, it's all about spatial computing. And there was this little synthetic biology thing. There was a possible application space over on the side. And now here today, the way my world currently looks, um, spatial computing has generalized and sort of morphed into aggregate programming because we realized the spatial part was actually not that important. That was just the, the easy source of, um, of algorithms to do our aggregate programs with. <laughs> and synthetic biology has grown in ways I would not have predicted at all five years ago in my research world. But one of the things that I find drives these shifts and that helps me understand what's happening is um, I find you can think about your relationship to research often in terms of three general categories. And at different times, different ones are in the driver's seat. And when you get a shift from one to another, that often drives a pivot in your research focus. So on the one hand, there's whatever your vision is, uh, you know, your big picture, you know, how you want to change the world. But the second part, you've got what are the skills that you have that you're bringing to the table for your way to go and try and chase that. And that's connected to those researcher niches. We all have different skills. And there's often a lot of different ways to try and chase the same idea. On the third uh, hand, there's what's the application that you're talking about as a motivator. And sometimes you'll find that um, you know, you're chasing your vision going along and you know, somebody comes to you and says, well, I don't know if I buy into your vision, but you know, this programming language design stuff that you've been doing on your way to it, I've got this other problem over here that that would work for also. And suddenly you're doing a pivot based on skills. Now you're in a space with a totally different vision, totally different applications, but you carried over this body of skills that shifted you there. Or you may be in an application space where, uh, you know, so like from my vision of aggregate programming and we started applying to synthetic biology, and now, in order to make progress there, I started needing to get engaged with parts of the problem that I hadn't thought about before. In order to realize my vision, I'm having to develop new skills because I'm sort of pivoting around that application space. Um, I need to solve problems that I have some ideas about. I need to marshal new resources in there. And at different points in time, you know, different ones of these are sort of on top, dominating. And that's okay. That's part of what I find sort of shifts things back and forth. And moving in that sort of more tactical direction of thinking about what happens over time as a researcher. Another book that I highly recommend uh, is this Anthropological Study of Science conducted in the uh, 1970s by uh, Bruno Latour and Steve Woolgar where um, essentially the anthropologists went to go and, and uh, live amongst the scientists to see what this strange tribe does. Um, <laughs> and by that I mean literally one of them took a job as a lab tech in a biology laboratory and, uh, you know, and was looking and asking, it's the, the introduction of this book is wonderful, it talks about like, you know, what relationship do the men arguing in this office have to the women with the typewriters over here or the mice on that side of the lab? It's a wonderful reinterpretation. And through this, um, you know, one of the things that they pull out that I find, found revelatory was an idea of uh, scientists as investors of credit. Uh, there's this cycle where if you have funding, you can use that to do experiments that produce data. If you have data, then you can use that uh, to create publications. Those publications, in turn, um, both help you to get funding and help you to get you know, better positions and being in a better position in a more reputable location with better connections also helps you get funding. And so there's this sort of view of of science as this cycle of 
you know, investing and building your credit. Uh, and that means that you have to have some competence at all parts of this. But in graduate school, we usually mostly end up with our training just focusing on this part, doing good work. You know, being able to, given funding, <coughs> transform it into valuable data. We get some training in writing publications, um, but a broader picture of this, which I find is, is not as well trained as I think that would be valuable, is not just saying what you did, but also being able to explain its significance, how it fits into the larger picture of science. And then there's challenges as well in, you know, this transform from publications to funding is essentially about making plans about work that might be important, figuring out what are, what are those important problems and how would you get from A to B, describing what you do over here and why it's important. And then I generalize this notion of position a bit in our more modern social media-laced world to um, ensuring visibility for your work. One of the ways to be visible is to be at a place that people look at. But there's a lot of other ways to be visible available to us now as well. So I want to focus in on, uh, on a couple of these, starting with this notion of figuring out significance and importance, both in the planning and the reporting. And there, something that I find a very valuable tool is this thing called Heilmeier's Catechism. Uh, named for a man named Heilmeier who ran DARPA uh, for a while in the 1970s. And <clears throat> uh, this was the set of questions that he would ask about every <coughs> proposed research program that DARPA was considering running. Uh, and the program managers in turn passed them down and asked them to every uh, <coughs> project that was proposed to them. And this is still very much a part of the DARPA culture. And these are a bunch of very simple questions. And if you can answer all of them, then you're probably in a very good position to explain why your work is, a, is significant <coughs> and also to help get funding for it. If there are some that you don't have strong answers for, that's a good place to invest some effort in thinking. <laughs> and that may start leading you down one of those pivots accidentally. So, you know, what is the problem? Why is this a hard problem? How is it solved today? You need to be able to compare what you want to do to the way that things are done. <coughs> and if this is a hard problem that people do somehow else today, why is now the right time to go and, and do it? What's the new thing that means that we are likely to make progress now when we couldn't before? You see a lot of investment in uh, some areas of research, but not many people working on, say, you know, gold box conjecture. You know, because we don't really have very much in the way of good attacks on it right now. That's not a heavy area of investment. If we do fix it, if we do figure out this problem, what does it matter? What will it change about the world if this research is successful? And not just in a philosophical sense, but in a, some sort of concrete, measurable impact. How do you break down your vision into the different organizational elements that need to be done in order to accomplish it? Not just the most interesting and hardest part, but the sort of, you know, boring things around the edges that also need to be done and that if you aren't paying attention might turn out to actually be where the hard part is located. Along the similar lines, it's not enough to say, you know, here I am and there's my vision. What are the steps along the way where you can look and see, I'm making progress or I'm not making progress, I need to change what I'm doing? How are you going to measure those uh, intermediate results in some sort of quantitative way so that you can't fool yourself into saying, well, I sort of made it work kind of once, and what will it cost? This is a really useful rubric to walk through and be able to ask yourself about any program of research 
that you want to do or that you're engaged with. This is good for writing a proposal. It's also really good for writing a paper. If you can answer all of these questions, you will answer a lot of the things that reviewers will ding you on. Shifting to another part of the circle, this question of making yourself more visible in the community. There's a lot of good ways to do that. Um, I recommend um, you know, looking for opportunities, and especially early in your career, say yes a lot. Say no a lot once you start saturating. But one of the really good ways is being involved um, you know, we're in, uh, where there are opportunities with you know, organizing events. It's not hard to help organize a workshop um, at a conference like this or most conferences. Um, review papers if you have an opportunity. If you aren't reviewing papers yet, let your advisor know that you'd be interested in being a sub-reviewer because in many venues, um, when a person gets a paper to review, they have an option to give it to somebody else as an apprentice reviewer. That's why I have a picture of Easy Chair up here. Great way to have visibility and build credibility in the community is to do a good job reviewing papers, serving on program committees. Give talks, even if you have to invite yourself places. Uh, put yourself up in front of people, especially if you're uncomfortable, because there's only one way to get comfortable. help teach, serve on panels if you have an option, and then more informal ways that you can set yourself up as well. You know, blogging, make sure your web page is at least vaguely up to date, um, all sorts of different social media possibilities. So as I say early on, say yes to a lot of opportunities if you can, even if it pushes yourself some. Let your peers, let your uh, mentors know that you're interested in doing these things that <coughs> set you down. But you don't want to spend too, too much time doing this, otherwise you don't have time to do the things that you really want to do. Uh, I have a budget for myself of, I put four hours a week as the amount of time that I think is appropriate on average, you know, amortized over a long period of time, for me to devote to service, and visibility. So service being things like reviewing papers, organizing, giving a talk like this. Uh, visibility being things like making sure <coughs> that my web page is up to date and you know, writing stuff on my blog. So this is, you know, it goes up and down with time. This week I'm uh, totally blowing through my service budget and so I won't do much service for the next couple weeks, but that's how it works. But I also think there's something critical missing from Latour's cycle of credit. This cycle is all focused on the things that we do in our professional life. And supporting all of that is the question of whether we're surviving as a human being. Because being a researcher is hard. One of the hardest things you may have heard people talk about is imposter syndrome. This is this feeling that you don't belong. You're not worthy. There's something, something wrong with you that's not like the others. Definitely you're not one of the popular kids. I'm going to tell you that in all honesty, this happens to me pretty much every time I go to an event. You know, at some point, you know, early on or beforehand, I'll have this crisis of confidence, a horrible moment of doubt, wondering you know, why I'm here. What, why am I doing this with my life? Um, you know, is what I'm doing worth it? Do I fit in this space? Here in Augsburg, it was Tuesday morning um, at about 7.30 a.m., walking from my hotel to the conference. Um, there was about 10 minutes on that walk where I was just like, ah, what the hell am I doing here? 
I've been doing this for a while. Some people don't hit this, but most of us do. And the things that help me when I'm confronting my imposter syndrome, one of the things I always have to remember is that everybody shows the world the face they want it to see. We don't usually show the world of our despair at three in the morning. We show the world what it looks like when we've got our act together. And so the view you have of other people is not the same as the view you experience of yourself. Another thing is that the people that you notice, there's a selection bias. And that greatly distorts your view of the world. I have a terrible habit of looking at people who are 10 years advanced of me in their career and comparing myself to them rather than the people who are actually my peers in terms of what they've done over time. And so, of course, I'm going to feel bad if I'm comparing myself to somebody who not only is 10 years older than me and has been at this 10 years longer, but also the reason that I noticed them and started comparing myself to them rather than somebody else who would be a more statistically average sample of the population is because that person's really awesome and they've done some amazing thing and you know, are getting millions of dollars a year in, in research funding. This is a major perceptual bias. Another important thing to remember. And along those lines also, just because I you know, am working with a small group and a relatively small budget doesn't mean my work is less valuable than somebody who's got a group of 20 people and are publishing in Nature and Science. We are social and hierarchical primates, and so we really want to measure ourselves relatively. But your value as a researcher, the value of your work is absolute, not relative. And finally, this connects with what I said before about the Renaissance man being dead, is that we are all ignorant. And you have to become comfortable with the fact that you are ignorant. Being comfortable with the fact that you're ignorant doesn't mean being proud of ignorance, that proud that you don't know something. It means um, being comfortable saying, I don't know that. Here's what I do know. What should I know about that? How do I connect what I know with what other people know? We all work out a matter of ignorance, especially in cross-disciplinary research, which with everybody here is engaged in, and where most of the interesting things happen. But the nature of cross-disciplinary interaction is that everyone in the room is ignorant, and it's just different which things we're ignorant about. So becoming comfortable with saying, I don't know, in a way that's not defensive and that invites that connection makes a difference too. But most importantly of all, just having a name for that moment of despair can help in being able to work through it. Understanding that imposter syndrome exists, that it's a thing that's real, that so many of us deal with it. One of the other things I think is really important is to find support for yourself as a researcher. (laughs) That can be through your peers, your mentors. Uh, One of my other favorite resources to suggest is um, the Academia site uh, on Stack Exchange. So all of you who program probably know Stack Overflow, uh, where we get many pieces of help. They have an academia-focused site where people show up and ask questions like, how do I deal with discouragement as a graduate student? My co-author says that I shouldn't be first uh, author anymore because they're going to give the talk. What should I do? Uh, (laughs) All sorts of, you know, from, uh, you know, uh, know, honest confusion to dealing with the venal sins of the world. Uh, I like this, this resource. There's a lot of places that you can get support out there. Make sure you have some place that you can go and get support. 
And last, and most importantly, keep an eye on your life outside of science. It's never a good time for your life if science has its way, because science is endless. There's always more research to be done. And it's always a high pressure time. You've got to do your thesis. You've got to find um, a postdoc post. You've got to get into a faculty post. You've got to make your you know end year review. You've got to get the next contract. You know this funding crunch is coming up. It's never a good time to have kids. It's never a good time to date. It's never a good time to take that long vacation that will restore your soul. Do it anyway. This means that you'll have to make compromises. You're going to have to triage things. And one of the things that I, reading um, an article about being a professional parent, saw as somebody saying, being a researcher and a parent, or being a researcher and then anything else that is not a researcher, means that you're going to drop the ball sometimes. What's important is to make sure you don't keep dropping the same ball. When I go home tomorrow, when I get off the airplane, I'm not going to do any research work this weekend. There's something I really need to get done before Tuesday. <coughs> I could do it this weekend. But I've been away for a little over a week, and I owe my daughter that weekend. I can't drop the same ball too many times. Something that I find really useful for helping myself manage which balls am I dropping and why is just keeping track of my time. I think of it in a few different ways. There's, I find there are three qualitative different types of time that I spend at work, and it's important for me to know which one I'm spending so I can help make those triage decisions. On the one hand, it's important to have big chunks of time for focused work where you can get really deep on something. There are other times where you've got just broken time, where you know, you've only got 30 minutes <coughs> or you're getting interrupted by phone calls and then just say, okay, I'm not gonna be able to get so deep into something. Save up your, your scut work, your paperwork, your travel expenses, your um, you know, got to fill in this report sorts of things. And that's a good thing to do with broken time. And then the third thing is burnout time. Um, especially when you're feeling stressed. And I'll find myself sometimes spending time at the office, time at work, where I'm not doing work. But I'm at work because I'm guilty about the work that needs to be done. And I personally at least find the only thing to do there is make sure that you walk away so that the time that you're spending at work when you're dropping other balls is time where you're actually working. Make sure you get enough of that time. So of course, you can't be a part-time researcher very well. Not, uh, you know, at least not more part-time than you've set your contract for. But walk away from your burnout times so that you're not dropping a ball and dropping the other balls at the same time. And in that vein, I'll just close with a picture of me and Kiwi uh, last weekend between the, uh, the Swarm Intelligence Conference I was at and this conference. And I had a day free in Brussels. And rather than spending it working in the hotel room, we went to visit the hotel. <coughs> Thank you, and I hope that this has been helpful. And I'll make sure I make the slides available so that...